All right, well, welcome to those who are who are here with us. I'm sure we'll have a few others um, come in and join us, but my name's Tim. We got Tom and Chloe with us today. Um, I guess we can go ahead and start here pretty quickly, but wanted to welcome everyone in. We're excited to be doing this today. Hopefully we'll be engaging and interesting for you all, and hopefully we'll, we'll have a lot of questions for you all to, that are answered, and you can throw some to us, but I'll introduce myself first. So my name is Tim Miller. That's me with the floral tie there on the left, if you couldn't tell. Um, I'm a USSDR team lead at Cognizem, and we are a global sales intelligence platform, which I won't break down right now, but with most people being in sales and marketing, you probably know what that is. Um, and then we've got Chloe here as well. Chloe, you can introduce yourself. Yeah, so hey guys, I am Chloe. Um, just want to say a massive thank you to Cognizm for hosting the webinar today and inviting me on here to speak with you guys. So I am an associate seller for Harrison and I focus on the growth markets and SMB. So for a little bit of background to Varicent, they are the leading providers in sales performance management. And we offer solutions that help companies plan, operate and pay when it comes to kind of their employees. So I think ensuring that employees get their incentives accurately and on time. So that's the sort of thing. But yeah, so I'll pass over to Tom um, from Salesforce. Thanks, Chloe. And yeah, thanks to Cognizant for, for putting this on, for inviting us and for driving some attendance. And it's good to not see you all, but know that you're all in here. I can see the, the little tab saying we've got 70 or 80 attendees, which is great. Um, I work as an SDR here for, for Sales Loft in EMEA, focused on the commercial space. Anything from about 100 to about 750 employees is sort of the people that I speak to. But yeah, looking forward to, to having a good discussion and hopefully leaving leaving you guys with something you can you can take away and, and act on over the next couple of weeks and days to hopefully help you hit your target in October and November and the rest of the year. Yeah, absolutely. So um, today we'll kind of take you through like the agenda. Obviously, we're introing ourselves right now. You guys know what that looks like, but we're going to talk about first, what does it look like to have cadences that convert? That's obviously the topic of the webinar. So we're going to go into that and then we're going to talk about ways to test and track those cadences. What metrics should you use? What metrics should you not use? And then personalization is obviously a huge, huge topic when it comes to writing cadences. How personalized can you get? Is personalization at scale real? Is it a myth? Things like that. And then we'll talk about what we've learned personally from cadences at work and we'll show you some tips and tricks on that and then we'll also do a Q&A and also want to mention that if you all have any questions throughout this entire webinar presentation discussion send them when you have them don't wait until the Q&A we definitely want to be able to engage with everyone and chat with as many people as possible and want to make sure that we can get to everyone's questions so when you have questions when they come up don't be afraid to send them in the chat and we'll make sure to get to them or at least as many as we can. So moving on from the agenda, we first want to talk about the main goals of cadences. Obviously, we want to know why are we even writing cadences. So you see a couple of points here. I think the biggest thing for me personally when it comes to cadences, so for my role as an SDR and as I lead some other SDRs, we understand how important it is to have a multi-channel approach, right? We don't just bang the phones. We don't just type away on our keyboards. We want to have a lot of different uh, aspects of our cadence. And the way that I see cadences personally, you can be personal in the first couple, but to to get as many messages out as possible, right? You have to bring the personalization down. The biggest aspect for me is to understand that these marketing cadences are a way to give us a chance to follow up with our prospects, they're not probably going to be the number one way that you book meetings. I could be wrong, um, and we'll get into that a little bit. I know that Tom specifically, um, he likes the email cadences to book meetings, but for me, it's more of a way to market my solution, a way to introduce myself, say, hey, not sure if you caught my emails, but um, that's really my goal with cadences is to kind of supplement it with my cold calling. Um, so those, those are my reasons. Tom, I know you've got some more things to add here as well. Yeah, so I mean, from my perspective, and from what we see our customers using sales law for, like there's loads of different ways that people use cadences. We even use them in the recruitment process. You can use them on, on, your, on your customers to ensure the account managers are touching them regularly enough. But really when I talk about cadences, the, the only area that I really feel qualified to sort of sit on a event like this and talk about is, is outbound cadences that I run. So from, from cold prospects, they, they've, they've never heard of me, might have heard of sales law before. 
and I'll, and I'll utilize the cadence to, to get engagement. And for me, I suppose that all of the, all of the goals of a cadence boil down into one thing and that's to get a bite to get some engagement from our prospect whether it's an objection whether it's a no that we're using your competitor and we're in contract for a few years whatever it is i want to know that once the cadence is finished that 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 prospect has been exhausted or at least that specific person in the business has been has been exhausted and it's not and i'm not going to get an opportunity with them at the moment as things stand so don't know if you have a different perspective on that chloe if you've got anything that sort of varies from what i've just said yeah so i mean obviously like you guys can all see so we kind of came up with the three main goals in a sense and for me i really go from these three main goals so it helps me personally in the sense that like it means that leads don't fall through the cracks because i'm prospecting loads of companies and loads of people and it basically just ensures that prospects are moving across all your different stages and interactions within your sales funnel so they're seeing that variety of activity from different mediums whether that's like videos linkedin emails whatever it is and kind of by having them pass through all these stages it does kind of really lead on nicely to helping your company become visible because for me cadences are like the key to consistency they basically allow your prospect to see the different aspects of the company like i was saying via linkedin via videos when you're on a Zoom call, have you got your little logo up? It's kind of always reinforcing your brand and the cadence just make sure that you're hitting all those points. And then I guess, yeah, it kind of goes into the last point, the multi-channel touch point and interaction will slowly start to make it stick in their mind. And it's kind of making sure that you're the first person that they think of when they decide that they need it. Um, so yeah. Yeah, yeah I so think I it's think important. Just Sorry, sorry, sorry Tal. I'll, I'll go and then I'll let you go. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I think it's important too to remember like you want to be different. You want to give your your prospect an experience because if you're just sending out a cold email, I mean, I even get cold emails now as a team lead, which is insane. But people will send me emails and I got one yesterday that had, you know, the, the merge field first name on there and it's like ugh, like that's tough to see and those mistakes happen but past that too like you want to be able to educate your prospect or pique their curiosity or something if you're just going to go out there and kind of vomit everything that you do you're probably not going to get a lot of engagement you really want to be able to again give the prospect an experience and i tom you got more to add yeah so i just think there's the two sides of it, right? There's what the prospect sees and what the prospect feels and they get prospected. But like what Chloe said, from from my perspective as an SDR, as a user of a platform that does that, I think it's given you the framework to know what's what's their next best action. So like you've got you've got this framework in front of you, you come in, you know what you're doing in that day, you know that after an email it's good to call or whatever it is that you figured out from your own statistics, you know you're doing the next best thing and you're not using your gut. You're, you're able to, to use a, a more a more developed framework around that engagement. Yeah, absolutely. And then, so now we'll kind of go through like do's and don'ts of cadences, which is uh, I think a good way to kind of break things down on uh, on a more fundamental standpoint. But I think in terms of do and don't, like one big thing I see, some mistakes that I see, maybe people who are writing cadences or even emails that I receive, is they overuse the merge fields they're going to say things like my name a lot or the company name and it's just very very obvious that this was not personalized and i get it you you want to send emails at scale you want to personalize at the same time as best as you can but when i'm seeing my name like three times in an email like no one writes like that i just know that they're overusing the merge fields and then one thing too is subject lines they're going to make people actually curious and want to open the email my my goal with a subject line is just to get the open. I think that's the only thing that the subject line has to do. So if you can say things like, hey, you know, did you know this or have you heard subject lines that are quick, simple like that and are like, have I heard what? Like, I need to read this. That That's a good way to get people uh, to open up that emails. Um, so the, the, that's some perspective for me, Chloe. I know you've got some more to add here as well. Yeah, so I guess for me, it's all about like hyper personalization, which I guess is kind of like what everyone is going for. And I do definitely agree it has to come like at the beginning of the cadence. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, Chris Voss is a great guy to go and look up after this um, webinar. And we had a talk by him and he basically told us that you have seven to 10 seconds to make an impression on someone. And 
for me, I think one thing that is to take away is to remember to sell the problem before you're selling the solution. Because especially for me in my industry, um, I'm looking at growth markets. And so I might be interacting with people who can see that something's not working, but they don't initially know what they need to solve it. So that's why you're looking to solve the problem, uh, sell the problem, sorry, before you're selling your solution. Um, and yeah, so I was gonna say, remember that your kind of your first call, your first touch isn't necessarily look into your product. It's more opening that door and getting them to step through. And like you were saying, kind of getting them to onto the next call and booking that meeting in that sense. I think yeah. my I think my sort of um, thing that I'd add on that, and I really agree with, with pretty much everything you've said, is that you've really got to be driven by your prospects, right? It's not about what works for you. I don't like sending emails on Thursdays because I'm playing golf or whatever it may be. I think it's really worth focusing on on your prospects. So for example, if, if I'm trying to speak to like a VP of sales in Silicon Valley, I can call him, I can keep calling him, call him three, four times a day and it's not gonna be a problem. If I do that for a CTO based in Manchester, it's not gonna work. I'm gonna burn that relationship. So I think the key thing is with your cadences is build them around both persona and persona location and anything you can do to sort of culturally understand what their day looks like and what their week looks like. So for example, and I've come up against this myself is sending e emails to Israel on a Friday afternoon is gonna fall on deaf ears because they're observing the Sabbath. So building your cadences around your prospects and, and sending emails to, to Israel on a Sunday afternoon, is gonna be hugely more successful and make you stand out in a different way. So I think it's really, really about trying to know your prospect as much as possible and incorporate that into your outreach. I think one point off of that too, Tom, is it's really important when you talk about do's and don'ts, like don't sell what your product is, but do sell what it does. Like, for example, I sell a, a sales intelligence platform. That means nothing to most people. Some people in sales are like, okay, I think I know what that is. But like, I don't sell mobile numbers for decision makers. I sell more meetings booked, significantly shortening the deal cycle and bonusing you as a VP of sales. That I don't sell the mobile numbers. I sell what it does for the for them. So whatever your solution is, don't talk about what it is. Talk about what it does for people. Um, so yeah. I guess to kind of follow up, we've got a question come in saying, "What is your best advice for someone new to the role, and what do you wish you would learn sooner rather than later?" And that was from Caitlin. So thanks for joining. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, Caitlin, if you have not connected with me yet on LinkedIn, connect with me. Send me a message. I have. Uh, I like to be pretty active on LinkedIn. One of my posts went uh, kind of popped off a little bit, I will say, um, on this very topic. And to keep it short and sweet, whatever your KPI is, hopefully you have KPIs for like activity, you need to increase that by at least 25%. Because when I came in, in my first in my first month at Cognizant, I wasn't going to be able to hit target even with my ramp if I was going to be doing the same amount of activity as the best person on my team because they can get away with doing a certain amount of activity because they have more experience. I need to I need to increase my activity to at least equate to the experience level of that person. So make sure your activity is really, really high. You get more reps in. Um, also, my only other tip uh, would be like, sales is not your identity. Your value is not found in, did I book a meeting or did I close a, a deal this this week or this month or whatever? Like, enjoy it enjoy the process of sales don't let one bad day affect you like you are not your identity as a salesperson so i think my biggest thing on that as well just to add to what you said and i really agree with that people can get really down if you're not hitting your number i think just focus on the inputs you're doing and improve them um but it's just really important to see what other people are doing right especially if you're new to sales but even if you're new to a role and you haven't so when i moved to sales after i hadn't sold to um sales people and i hadn't really sold a software solution like this so i spent my first two weeks aside from onboarding listening to everybody's calls over and over again i found the top performing top performance calls in the states and top performing calls in EMEA and just listen to them listen to them while I made my dinner listen to them while I was going for a walk and just try to absorb as much osmosis really from the way they describe things the way they handle objections so it's just at the start just really replicate those people that are doing well because that's probably what they did to get so to get to that point so that's the thing I'd lean on your colleagues and lean on your your the other people in your sales org yeah and I feel like 
nowadays LinkedIn is literally like the social platform for working and everyone like connects and does that so definitely get on there and connect with all of us but also I think if you are going to use LinkedIn in that sense make sure you have a presence make sure you're posting you're interacting I like videos so I'll post out videos and stuff like that but by allowing someone to see your openness it gives you a snippet like into your life and actually like creates trust with the people you're trying to prospect which I think kind of leads nicely onto our next topic, which is how to build cadences that convert. Um, so kind of really just following on from that, for me to build cadences that convert, it's all trust-based influence. So like relationships, I think, are one of the only things that will actually alter deal timelines. And so I'm all for this element, like we're all humans and to really see a cadence come to light, that's what you wanna come through. So like I was saying, for me, it's the verbal communication. So it's things like your videos, your voice notes and your calls. And it's really just showing them that you're not automated in that sense. And um, I think it's important to kind of get people to think and to act because people are often untroubled and that's how they see it. So you have to make them actually think and consider and act and make them need your solution. But Tom, anything to add to that one? I think just going back to what I what I said before, right? It's really about trying to orient when you when you reach out and how you reached out based on what your persona and what not just the persona, but what that person, how he's engaged with content and what works best. So, for example, our enterprise team, we, so as a, as a as an uh, as an org, our our mere team set, used to send videos on the first day of the cadence, and our enterprise team have just shifted that to later in the cadence because typically with with enterprise and we found from looking at the stats they don't want to click on that link on the first email they'll click on a link with someone they know and someone they've seen a few times and become familiar with them but very early on in the cadence it wasn't working so well in that enterprise space it was working well in the commercial space so i think the big thing is 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 changing things based on your prospects and being agile to do that and looking at the data and following that so that you can keep repeating success and and try new things i think that's that's critical yeah and i think one thing too is when it comes to actually how you build the cadence out like sit down and think about what does my prospect do throughout their day what do they struggle with what are they concerned with what's going to cause them to get what how am i going to grab their attention so as us like a lot of us here are at our sdrs or aes or maybe a 360 sales role whatever the case may be um it's hard to know you can interview your boss you can interview your vp of sales if possible you can go across other companies and look at your connections and say hey like i have a couple questions for you can you help me out and maybe it'll lead to a meeting booked as well and i think that it, it just comes down to like what do they want to see what's going to grab their attention what are they struggling with so if you can really get into the mind of your prospect by interviewing your prospects to start kind of like tom did with the with the gong calls if you're using gong or chorus or uh, sierra or whatever whatever or those... sa sales loft is what i was using yeah <laughs> oh okay so yeah so, so sales loft actually like whatever you're using to uh listen to the calls yeah um or if you have a step further as well like whatever the case may be you can list those calls interview those people as well and understand like what language are they speaking in how can i speak in that language as well and almost put that exactly in the email I was just going to add to that it kind of like sums it up but you're wanting to find the difference between sympathy and empathy right so sympathy is being able to put yourself into another person's shoes and feel what they're feeling but what we're wanting to do as SDRs and BDRs is that empathy so you understand someone's like thoughts their feelings so well that you can summarize it but that doesn't necessarily mean that you emotionally care it's rather just that you understand and again it's kind of like people like those who generally feel like they're understood and it's kind of our job as SDRs, BDRs to understand that and use empathy and you've got to say go further than just being like I understand it's not enough you need to like take it one step further and kind of regurgitate what they're saying in your own way to make them feel understood. Fab, I think we're on to the next slide. Yeah, so I think I was just going to sort of lead this up and 
impact. I've got a really simple sort of way of looking at looking at my own personal outreach and my cadences and what's working and what's not working. And I think it's looking at it step by step. I know we're all at the top. Well, those of us that work in SDR and that are doing prospecting are at the top of the funnel. But it's really looking at like what's going to get your email opened. And for me, the two things that get my email opened is good prospecting. So understanding that I'm speaking to the right person and it's relevant to them. And then, like Tim mentioned earlier, having a subject line that's both personalized and relevant to the role and also going to generate some interest. And then at that point, my, my good prospecting and a good subject line is going to get them to open my email. And the first couple of lines of my email is what's going to get their attention and get them. And for me, I want them to click on my video because that's got a little bit more personalized stuff. And it's me speaking to the camera. It's harder to reject a person than it is a name. So it's getting from the get from the subject line to the body of the text to the to the video being opened, the video being watched. And then from the video being watched, hopefully at that point, you, you, you gain their attention enough to get a discovery call out of them. Or at least you've definitely made yourself familiar enough to then to then get them on the phone and get some engagement that way. So it's really about, for me, I analyze those different steps and how am I getting on between my clicks and my, between my opens and my clicks. And then for my clicks, how many clicks are getting me a discovery call. And then that's the big thing that I think on a, on a personal level is really important. But then on a wider, more zoomed out level, I think it's really important to figure out which steps are working and why and making those changes, not being afraid to make those changes like we meant, like I mentioned earlier with the enterprise team putting videos later on. If you're not getting so many clicks, there might be an external reason for that. And it's just having the ability to 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 move around and be be agile with that. I don't know if you had any other anything else to add on that on that Chloe from your perspective. Well, I was just gonna say we've got a question from Ari, which is saying, What have you seen that works and gets attention um, of decision makers specifically in enterprise? And I know I'm growth market, so maybe Tom or Tim, you can just maybe answer that one for Ari. Yeah, I mean. I think that you have to understand uh, what do, again, what does a prospect care about? So like, think about your roles in SDR. All you care about is booking meetings. You care about your activity. You care about who am I gonna prospect today? When you take it all the way up to a VP level or even a C-suite level, they don't, they don't even think about that. They are so much more big picture. So you have to tailor the response more to the big picture. When you look at a director or maybe on a manager level, it's not going to be as big picture, but again, they don't care about the prospects. They care more about like, how can I keep my, uh, my reps productive? If it's like a director of sales, for example. So you have to understand, like, even if it is the enterprise level, you got to understand that it's going to take a lot of different decision makers. So getting one in is going to get your foot in the door uh, to getting multiple other decision makers in. But you've got to understand like the higher they go in rank, the bigger picture they're going to think about. And you should probably tailor the messages more toward that. I think on, on this one, there's a couple of things that are quick wins in, in, in any size of business. And I think there's bits like looking at what's changing in the business. And for example, I'm sending out a lot of the moment of screen grabs of YouTube videos or webinars that CEO is doing or leaders are doing and referring to objectives that you find in there. This is very enterprise specific, looking at their 401k or looking at what they're releasing to their to their investors about growth and what they're expecting to do. How is that? For me, I'm focused on pipeline and pipeline conversion. So if they mention those things, but quite simply, it's whatever your product, whatever you're solving, it's just getting into some of their documents and some of their own things and using that control F and trying to find things that are relevant to what you're doing and trying to trying to help them achieve achieve it personally. The sales leaders will have their own personal objectives of closed revenue and pipeline created. That's what they care about. And it's the same for whoever it is you're speaking to. It's about why them, what do they care about in their day to day? So like Tim mentioned, I care about how many meetings I've booked, how many of my meetings go to demo and become an SDO and become customers. And how are my, how are my open rates and my click rates? And if you talk to me about something that's going to increase my click rate by 20%, then I am all ears and I'll read your email and I'll click through all the links. But if you talk to me about something much bigger picture that doesn't affect me, then I'm not going to be engaged. So I think it's really about one finding about finding out what matters to them and then finding some content and genuinely relevant and up to date information that you can use to piggyback on there and, and, and justify it and give yourself a bit more credibility. Yeah, I was going to say, we've got another question from Amy. How do you balance the hyper personalization and automated cadences? And so for me, 
I, because I'm sending out videos and things, if I found something that's like specific to personas and companies or industries, then what I'll do is I'll make a video which is kind of hyper personalized, which is addressing all the issues and pain points that they'll have, but I just won't ever say their name. And that's where I put my personalization. So I'll send the video out and that might be to multiple people, but each time it's someone different um, that I'm sending. So I'm writing their name in the actual text rather than the video. So it's almost like a blockchain video that I can just send out multiple times to many different prospects, but each time it looks hyper personalized to them. And I'll take a minute or two to go through and write a very um, intricate first liner that's gonna get their attention in that sense. So you're kind of scaling it still being personalized um but making sure that you're actually hitting all your target and making sure that you're getting through all the amount of prospects that you need yeah i think this does bring us nicely onto this slide around around personalization and it's a bit of a buzzword personalization at scale is it is it possible is it not i think to a certain extent it is and as a team recently we all sat down and created what, what we're using sales after snippets but just little short emails and little short um attention grabbers and things that relate to specific things going on in their business and if you can use enough of these things if you understand what the triggers are that you're going to be utilizing in your emails and in your outreach so for us it might be hiring sdrs moving into a new region launching a new product any of these areas are critical for us so if you can write person like well you can write things specific to that trigger that, and you have enough of them 40 or 50 or 60 however it, however big it becomes after working for a while on it then you can still maintain that personalized and specific and relevant email without having to without having to write it individually every time and i think one of my colleagues said to me once and he said if you write it twice then save it so never if you've got the same thing you're talking about just save it and then for us, I'll use snippets in sales often and use it. And then I can gather analytics on that as well. So then we can A, B, C, test our hypothesis around hiring SDRs and see which one's working. And I think that's critical. But one of the things that I learned really early doors in this is, is to have like a, a process around how you personalize. And this will allow you to do it more so because ultimately there's a line you draw between how personalized you want to be and how many things, how much outreach you want to do and somewhere that you're going to find your your golden point but i think that really depends on one your persona to the stage of your business and ultimately how much how much time you have in the day to do it if you're a full cycle or if you're if you're just an sdr but those three areas are information so using something relevant on their page something they're doing something they're hiring for and then and then pointing that back to a pain they might have and then pointing towards a solution and I do this in a video which means that ultimately you can't do maybe quite as much if you were just sending out emails but we've decided there's a certain point at which is our sweet spot and we hit it like that but it really takes a bit of iteration to get to get to the point where you understand how much personalization you need to do and do it in a really quick way there's a, a video my colleague Charlie put out on her LinkedIn recently where she talks about how she does that and I'll share that with everyone in the in the link afterwards or if you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn because there's there is ways of doing it quicker but I don't think you can really personalize and automate to a massive audience I think that is impossible I think one other point here is if you work in an industry or work for a company where you have either a solution that's like really easy to basically ask others for help for, or you just work in an industry like, for example, like Tom is with SalesLoft, a big competitor of SalesLoft is outreach, obviously. So one thing that I'll do, we have a big competitor as well, like Zoom Info is big in our space. If someone searches or if someone posts on LinkedIn, that they're looking for Zoom Info alternatives, you can literally just look, type in Zoom Info alternatives and you will you will get results. And that's one way too, you'd say, hey, like reach out to them on LinkedIn, shoot them an email, whatever the case may be. Hey, saw you're looking into XYZ solution, here's how we help. Um, or even like before that, what's causing you to look into this? Like what, what what's important to you right now that that causes this to be an ob objective for you. So that's another pretty sneaky way that you can get in and try to level up uh, your own game and potentially um, start to, I guess, just just be more creative. And again, it's about giving that that prospect an experience. So that's one thing that I do as well for the personalization side. Yeah, and so I was just gonna add, so it's for me, it's obviously like persona and company 
but there's like certain things which obviously you have to go and research but like um tom was saying you can make it into snippets so it's almost like all done and you just have to fill in certain things um but like things that i found to really kind of drive people to be opening my thing my emails would be things like taking a quote from from the ceo or a statement from a report um now i got told that public companies have like a legal duty to discuss risk factors so when i'm looking in finance it's great to pull figures from that um and really kind of like use them and also another thing that i've only recently started to do but it's worth looking is to see if they've started initiatives especially if they're finding pains and they're trying to solve something and even just dropping in the name of the initiative that they've started shows that you've kind of like gone one step further but it's it's a kind of it's easy steps and it's very small but it makes a huge amount of difference because it shows okay this person's gone one step further to actually really try and understand my pain my point what we're doing to help so I think we had a question here um, from from Ben around what sort of subject lines work when sending a video. And I think that goes back to like how personalized you want to be. I think for me, like, like a sort of tier three one that I'm not spending too much time in. If I was sending it to Chloe, it'd be like Chloe and Tom, quick video. And that has a decent open rate. Um, but I would say that ultimately, like it doesn't, the video is something you've got in your arsenal to maybe get them to open it because you you can show in the subject line you've made effort. But I think otherwise the same rules of engagement with subject lines still apply. Like you want to do something interesting and engaging. So I often, and something the team do is like, if I found out that Chloe like ice skating, I'd mention mm -hmm. ice skating and booking more meetings. And that would be my title, it would be ice skating and booking more meetings. And then utilizing tools out there like reach desk or sending vouchers. So notice you just got back off annual leave or, back from holiday, lots of emails, free coffee below, something like that that's going to get them to click and engage. I think ultimately the video can be used, but I think any a good subject line is a good subject line. And we have a couple of subject line graders that are out there on, on our Sales Off Labs website. So it's a good place for you to go and, and see how they're, how they're working, how they're performing. And that's based off based off the data that, that, that we see out there with thousands of emails. I think one thing you can do too, like emojis, often get a really good open rate if it's for a video like literally just put like the camera emoji and just put like video attached like it could simply be that simple um that's one thing that i've done in the past that gets a pretty good open rate so that's one thing you can consider as well yeah so i feel like this kind of is leading us on nicely to learning from winning cadences um so yeah so learning from winning cadences really comes down to those open discussions kind of like what we've been saying like talk to your sales team talk to your leaders and basically see what's working and what isn't um it's all about getting the feedback um on your work and this can be done like we were saying listening to your calls reading back over emails that have got responses seeing how like you've interacted with a prospect on linkedin has it worked has it not and what was it that caused it was it a video that caught their eye something like this and um, I think really when it comes to digital touches like LinkedIn and your emails and stuff, creating a winning structure is a lot easier to achieve in my opinion, because you edit and you correct it and you can get someone to read it over and it's done in like five, 10 minutes, you're pretty much there. But when it comes to verbal touches, I think this is where people really need to focus their attention. Um, and I'd like to split it into two parts. You've got to always stay curious and you've got to focus on thinking about your tone. So always ask open-ended questions and this is how and what, because the rest of them, if you're asking where, they're one word responses. And what you want to do is you want to actually like open up a conversation and by asking how and what, I find that people actually have to give you a full sentence response or more likely to give you a full sentence response. And basically I think there's different phrases that work well in kind of starting this off and it's things like it sounds like you've got a place to start it seems like you're having a reason for thinking your reason for saying a reason for feeling kind of all these open-ended like triggers to get them to talk and ultimately it's all down to your delivery and your tone people are more likely to actually listen to what you want to say they're going to listen to your tone rather than what it is the words that you're saying so i think your tone is like a key key factor in actually engaging and bringing your prospects to the next stage but yeah tom anything to add to that 
I would say one of the most important things is, like we've mentioned here, getting feedback. And that can be after a positive response. So recently I booked a meeting with a specific company and I, after I got on the call, I sent them what I thought was an amazing email with a great video on it. And after I got on the first discovery call, I realized that the reason that I'd booked that call was because they were literally talking about buying a solution like ours at that moment. It was a case of, of right timing. So that was actually, although I thought it was because I'd done a great video, it was actually because I'd used good intelligence in terms of which accounts to go after and I I had sent them a video at the right time. So that was a case for using using good prospecting methods and doing lots of activity. In other calls, I found out that the reason they booked it was because they loved my engagement and they wanted their team to do something similar. So it's really about trying to understand why people are doing it, not just seeing which ones are getting clicks, but when you engage with the prospect, understanding why. And I think the second one, and it's so critical to anybody doing our role, if you're not having your calls recorded, I'd do whatever you can to get them recorded as soon as you can, because you need to, this information is an absolute gold mine in terms of the bits you might have missed. And if you go back to a call, even later on, a few months down the line, if it didn't go in the right way, you can still want, like, get yourself back up to speed of what's going on, but see those missed opportunities. So I think it's really about and just asking for feedback, getting feedback both internally and externally. And one, I suppose, tip or trick that people can use when they go out there and do their own prospecting is when you get a no, when you get a hard no on the email, ask why I'm trying to improve, especially with personas where I'm speaking to sales managers or uh, SDR managers. People like to coach and it's not just those roles, but it's human nature trying to help people. So if you say, look, I appreciate that. Can I understand why? Was it my prospecting? or is it something to do with the business internally, at least then you can go away and maybe improve on bits that they do give you feedback. And otherwise you can you can take, you can absorb yourself of any blame and, and keep moving forward. Because I think the most important thing is to be able to keep moving forward and trying to get better each time. And that's, that's all it really is. None of us are gonna be perfect. So I think it's just to keep plowing on and trying to get slightly better every week. Yeah, and I think one thing too, I didn't get a chance to touch on this, um, on our last slide talking about like how to track cadences but one thing you want to ensure you're doing is you may see like a really high reply rate to an email but if they're all saying like unsubscribe not interested take me off your list and go pound sand like that's not that's not what you're looking for you're looking for replies that are actually positive so don't like like just look at a reply rate and and say oh that's a winning cadence because it's high you may just have annoyed people enough to where they're like i stop please stop please um which is a good thing it's good to stay per persistent but that's one point that i would make and then kind of like tom said too like if you book a meeting like understand why you booked it was it because my email was really good was it because they're looking into this right now was it because um they have extra budget like whatever the case may be are they just trying to be nice and book a meeting uh so understand like why did this prospect actually book a meeting and you can start taking like a running total, like a tally of why people are booking meetings from you from each part of the cadence. So um, I would say I would say that's how you can particularly learn from from your cadences is is don't cause don't say something is a is a is a successful part of the cadence just because you have like good metrics, um, and also make sure uh, that you're you know you're figuring out why actually did they did they book a meeting and we've got a Question here from Danny asking, how do you decide the length and number of touches in building a cadence? And I think that that has a lot to do with like, are you targeting enterprise? Are you targeting uh, smaller businesses? What type of prospect are you targeting? So uh, Tom, I'll let you, let you take this one, see if you, had, you got any thoughts on this. Yeah, well, like you said, I think Danny, it really depends on exactly who you're targeting and, and, and also the, the type of sale you've got. So I'd be happy to, to speak to you on, on LinkedIn or something about sort of specifically what we see in your in your space. Um, but for me, I think the biggest mistake that people make is not having, not doing enough. And so you've got to be careful that you're not calling them three, three times a day, three days in a row. But on the whole, what we see is the biggest mistake people are making is not being thorough enough and not being comprehensive enough. So have a long cadence. I booked someone two days ago on day day 14 of my cadence on on step 11 or something like that so sometimes you can feel like there's no there's no use there but there is meetings that get 
get booked there and they get booked there regularly. And a lot of people aren't doing that. So you're leaving you're leaving money on the table if you're stopping at touch point six or seven. I think something like 90% of, of B2B meetings get booked after the sixth touch point. So it, like I said, it really depends on your specific situation, but don't don't bow out too early or you will be leaving leaving money on the table. I don't know, with yourself, Chloe, I know you speak to a variety of different um, prospects. So I don't know if it varies in the way that you engage with specific personas. Yeah. Well, I was more just going to kind of, well, broadly, remember that there's two types of no's. There's a no never, which is quite a hard no, and there's a no not right now. And I think that's kind of what we're all getting at is the point that like, yeah, you need to have a long cadence, but make sure that you do give enough time if they need to be nurtured for a little while. Because when you do get those no's, it can be disheartening, but like you've got to remember, it's a no, not now. So those are our possibilities. And then coming to think about it in terms of like different um, prospects in different areas, such as like finance, HR, sales, we have very different, um, it's more the wording that goes into that. I don't really have as much say when it comes to actually like the time frames. that's kind of been predetermined for me. But in terms of it's more down to the like the words that we're using in that and how we're actually engaging with the prospect. Um, and so things like if I'm talking to HR, it's more things like go to market strategies, whereas finance, it's very numbers heavy and kind of how are they driving their sales, their revenue, all of that sort of side. But yeah, I feel like we're on to our last slide, which is our Q&A. So if anyone wants to just drop any questions that they have into, into the chat and we can cover them for you guys. I think I think there were one or two that we missed. And to be fair, I think you've just sort of answered that, um, Chloe, in terms of yourself, which is, um, do you write your own cadences or is market and providing me the copy or is it a collaboration? Um, so I'll just talk to you about the way that we run it here at Salesloft and let, let the other guys sort of bounce, bounce their input off there. So we'll be running like one key cadence per quarter that we're all running most of our most of our outreach through. And so marketing and my SDR manager will be writing um, the framework to that. And at what point are we going to send an email? At what point are we going to send a snippet? At what point are we just going to send a bump? But when it comes to the actual content in there, because we're so highly personalized, it can't be written for me. And it also, there is, although we've got a really, really brilliant marketing team here at, at Salesloft, the best that I've, I've worked with, it needs to sound like me because I'm the one who's going to do the discovery call. And it's me ultimately that's going to be pushing them through and and then to the AE. So I think that's one thing that's really, really key. But the other thing is we will write our own nurture cadences or utilize a, a team one, but we have the ability to write them. And, and that's where you're really testing things out. So if you're working on, we worked on some bottom up cadences where we'll target specific people in our ideal customer profile businesses, we'll, we'll target salespeople. And that's something that we'll write. There's, I think a blended approach is probably what works. But what I would say is try and have as many people using a core cadence as possible and having as much outreach through it because that will enable you to get some really good data points on that. So I don't know how how you guys feel about that. And maybe Tim, because I feel like Chloe sort of answered it. Yeah, no, I mean, I think like, <clears throat> again, like it comes down to uh what's going to grab people's a a attention the most so it, as long as long as you can track that i think everything kind of funnels funnels from there i guess so like you mentioned tom like you can reach out to people and take like the bottom to the top approach um which i think i think could be really really helpful um and then from there like again just just track as much as you can um and being able to understand like what what are why are people booking and um not only why, but like, kind of like deeper, like get some get some good feedback from them that kind of helps you understand like, was it the email? And then behind that, like, what was there anything particular in my email that I can kind of feed into other emails? Or is there anything that in my phrasing I can feed into other conversations as well? So that's the only thing I would add. I, we've just got another question, which kind of is similar to this one. So what can a marketing team do or provide to ensure that they're providing full support um, for that outreach? And for us, what really helps, and I'm sure loads of people have it, is is like decks that we can go to. So if you are on a call, you can either pull that up if it's on Zoom, something like that, and go through it in that sense. And you can really hyper-personalize these with your marketing team to what it is that suits you. So we have 
specific ones for enterprise, for growth, um, for SMB, and you can really kind of dive down and get into a more uh, deeper level in that sort of sense. Yeah, on, on that, like what can a marketing team do to support me? I think one of the, the biggest thing, right, is, is giving you warm leads and telling and showing you which companies are engaging. We release a lot of content in terms of eBooks, in terms of things online, just to help salespeople. And clearly those are people that could do with more pipeline, could do with better, better tools because they're keen to improve. So they're great people for us to go after. Even if Chloe has downloaded something and engaged with us and I speak with someone else in the business, I know that there's some form of need there. If she downloads a 33 best email templates, that there's a, there's a desire there to, to get more out of email. So I utilize that. We did have another question come in around inbound leads, which I've got a really simple answer for like what's the best practice of following up on an inbound lead and it's asap within a minute within five minutes as quickly as you possibly can to come from a salesperson i think is the absolute is, is gold dust get to them as soon as you can and then and then comprehensively follow up because those people fill out a demo request if they don't come back to you straight away they still filled out a demo request they're still interested in what you want to do or whether it's a, a request for a survey depending on your industry just keep following up on those leads because there's a reason they did it and and, and there's a gold mine in there and a lot of people jeremy donovan our head of strategy did a, a went to the cloud 100s the 100 biggest cloud companies and put a demo request in into every single one and one the average the i think the average time that people followed up with him was once which is poor and it took a long time with a lot of them and so these people a lot of us are working in a competitive space if someone's doing it faster than you and getting them on the phone and engaging with the with them before you you're, you're not going to win that business so i think that's really critical to be quick and to be comprehensive on inbound leads yeah reach out as soon as possible like when i used to have inbound leads when i would reach out within five minutes like oftentimes they're going to say oh that was quick and like they like that the prospects like it when you reach out to them i mean they they literally just asked you for help they want to see your platform they want to see your solution so reach out to them as soon as possible i i definitely agree and then I, a good question here from chris um is the outreach from the american team versus emia team vary does it vary um being that you know you're more prevalent in emia um are the same approaches utilized by both teams or is there some variation so i think all of us have different like in terms of market saturation where we're at so my company is more prevalent in EMEA than it is in the united states what i will say um is that i notice SDRs. this is this comes back to a point from tom where he says to listen to your calls SDRs from EMEA it's like they speak in a different language compared to like us in the united states so that's one difference is that like we ourselves we speak differently from what i notice um and from what i've heard like even on demos like you guys out in amia are like good to just be like hey like how's it going what's up like how's the wet like just really just hang out and talk like in the us we're like let's get down to business like hey where are you calling from today cool let's do it so um that's one thing i noticed is that you might have a little more a, a longer leash in the amia market than you do in the united states um, so that's one thing I noticed, and then I'm sure that um, Tom, you specifically have have some thoughts on this. Yeah, hundred percent. So we're in a complete opposite situation in terms of where sales engagement is and where sales are in the states versus in the EMEA market in terms of like sort of market penetration. And one of the things you said resonated, but I kind of just like disagree on the on the on, on the way you you put it in terms of in in the EMEA, you can't just bulldoze in and have that sort of like go straight to business it's not even like having a longer leash is that you will you won't get this you won't get a good response unless you build up some rapport first so it's almost like it's not we have we have to do that you have to you have to engage with on a person to person level and it but it does vary across a mirror i think that's one of the big differences when I, especially i had a chat with my my marketing marketing manager earlier and i think that's one of the big differences in a mirror versus the us is although the us is very varied from florida to minnesota it, it still isn't as varied as even europe if you compare slovakia to sweden to britain and even if you look around around britain people engage in a in a very different way in london compared to in scotland so i think it's really critical to and it goes back to what i said before is to is to is to really tailor what you do specifically to the to what's working in that area 
But one of, the, I suppose, some some high level things that have worked for us is video works better in EMEA than US for us. Calling works better in the US than, than in EMEA. Um, we call less regularly. Maybe it's because of the availability of, of, of numbers due to GDPR, but I'm sure Tim can help you with that one. Um, yes, yes, but, we can. <laughs> Thank you, but, Tom. Um, <laughs> there we go. But um, I think really it just, it, video. I'd say those are the two high level things. I don't know if you've got any insight on this, Chloe. I can't remember exactly about that. And, and yeah, well, so I'm specifically UK and Ireland. So in terms of like how we're talking to other people, I don't have huge scope and knowledge on the rest of it. But especially like it's that trust based influence. And if I'm talking to a Geordie, there's this stereotype that they're more friendly, they're bubblier. So you'd kind of mirror them in that sense, because it makes people feel more comfortable. Um, and it's really like looking at the syntax. So how are they talking and mirror that? If they are a Geordie, but they're very like strict and probably the wrong words to use, but you know what I mean? If they're kind of that yeah. sort of way inclined, then you've got to stick to that. You can't just go in and assume that they're this bubbly persona. You've really got to like do your research, like what we were saying. Um, we got another question here from Claire. What is a good process to ensure sellers are sharing which elements of a cadence are working versus what's not working? And I was just going to say, personally, we have, um, as our team, what we do is we will share a call if it goes really well and we'll say what worked here, what didn't, what could we improve? Um, and we really like analyze the kind of open-ended questions that we're using, how we're engaging. And then we go further to look at what industry they're in and the persona to see how it all kind of balances out in that sense. But Tim, I don't know if you've got anything you can add um, onto that one. Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, like we're very heavy on the call side because uh, quick plug, like we can get you any mobile number for any decision maker anywhere in the world with 99% accuracy. So because of that, we have uh, access to a lot of mobile phone numbers. So when we make these calls, like if they go well, we do call reviews. If they don't go well, we do call reviews to like share all of this. We do it twice a week to where we get together for a half hour and ask people to share their calls and we can pick things that went well. We can pick things that didn't go well. Um, so I think that's one way to do it. Also, like for my team, I run something called a Friday cool down. Um, basically, we get together on Friday afternoon when we're all pretty much like done for the week anyway. And we just sit down and say, hey, like you book any meetings this week? Did you close anything this week? Like, why did it happen? Like, take us through the case, walk us through what went well um, and how you're able to win. So, Tom, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I've got quite, quite a simple one, really. It's it's a sales engagement platform. It's something that can show you like what what's working and what's not working out there. And then it allows you to focus on those areas that are working, stop doing the things that aren't. So I think is either buy sales engagement or convince your manager to buy sales engagement because that will really, really help in that space. We've got um, another question here. It says, how long do you think an email should be? Um, and in terms of that, I'd say keep an email to kind of under eight sentences. No one really likes reading long emails. Um, I'd also say read it out loud and see when you get bored of your own email, because that's a good way to see when they're, because they're 100% going to be bored quicker than you are. Um, also, I think like control the tone that you're using. You can use softeners if they're kind of, if it's a no, if it's a no, then things like, oh, I'm uh, like humbly, all of this kind of things. And when you're, um, looking at the communication you're always driving it back to the verbal so always trying to get back on the phone or through an email or zoom something like that um, and I think in an email you've got to kind of remember I guess it's a bit like playing chess you're never going to reveal your next six steps you always want to just do the one and get them to engage so I think it's kind of yeah it's key to always drive it back to that verbal communication. One thing I'd add on this is at times, if you get an objection specifically, like, why should I look at you rather than your competitor? And there are things where you can't just do it in a few sentences. And there are some there are some questions where they require a bit more detail. I think one thing that we found really, really works and is a lot more engaging for the prospect is, is using video in that objection handling. Because people are going to be more interested. And I wouldn't say do a three, four minute video, but I'd utilize video in that objection handling because it's a lot more engaging and then it, it, it you meet in a more in a more in an easier place to communicate so i think video for objection handling and longer emails things that could look like a big body of text because we've all sent them thinking that we've just written the best email ever covering every single possible objection 
and you, you get nothing back, it's not easy to engage with or do business with. So I think the shorter the better and try and find ways around, go the long way. And also always use sort of um, social proof in terms of those things when you're coming back. So if people ask you these sort of questions like about a competitor or why do I need this or something like that, or you feel like you could talk for 20 minutes about it, utilize if you're selling software G2 or utilize your Google reviews, whatever it may be that someone else has written about you that is in an independent and, and well known place and utilize that to, 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 to say a few more words without, without writing a very heavy email. I think I was just going to add, we've got a question that says, do you think, why do you think videos perform better in EMEA than the US? Maybe this kind of adds on to, on to the end of that one, Tom. Yeah, it's a difficult question. And I'll be honest, I did actually just ping it over to my team because I think there's a few different thought, thoughts on this. And um, I think ultimately, like one of the key things is that is that it's new and, and, and maybe in, in the States they've done it a bit more, whereas in EMEA, um, it hasn't been so, hasn't been done so much. And I think the other thing is like in, in EMEA, we're more like we talked about earlier with having to open up the call with a bit more relationship building and how is the weather, which is a very British conversation. It, it allows people to break down those barriers. I think one of those things, and it, it goes back to, and this isn't the scientific answer to it, but if you walk into a shop in, in the States and someone asks you if you need any help, on the whole, you're going to get a much more positive response in the states than you would see in 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 the uk for example i don't know about anybody british on the call but if a shop assistant walks up to you a lot of the time you say no i'm fine you might have 10 questions on the top of like you're thinking about but it's just a british thing where they'll say no i'm fine so maybe that's one of the reasons why it works better because it allows you to build a little bit more rapport early on and they can see your face they can hear your voice and they can get a little bit more about you at that point, but I, I, I don't have a scientific answer. All I can say is that it's working and we're gonna keep doing it. Yeah, and I think we've got, we can probably cover one more question here before we hop off. But um, basically the question in short is like, are there any red flags you get from, from positive replies to emails? So for me personally, um, I'm like, I want to book a meeting, so I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever I can to book the meeting, obviously, but there are going to be times where, you know, you might have a prospect say something to where they already look like they could be an issue. And we have some pretty famous people, even at our own company, or, or well, not our, our, our company, but our famous prospects, I'll say, who have come over and we're just like, yeah, we can't help them. Um, so there are definitely going to be times I don't have anything specifically because again, like as an SDR, our jobs are to book the meetings. Um, but I think overall, the goal is like to to make sure whatever they're asking, you answer the question and then you pique their curiosity enough to get to the next meeting. Yeah, and I'd probably just add on to that. Um, when you're thinking about like your prospects and who you're going after and stuff, like the red flags in that sense, like Tim was saying, we are always just trying to book that meeting, but I guess it would be quite good, especially when you're new into the role of think about all the, um, what it is that you're trying to sell and the things that don't work. So objections and that sort of side and be able to actually have a bank so you can kind of eliminate these people straight away because there's no point going after a prospect that's just gonna be cold. Yes, I think this goes back to what I said at the at the very start about that that meeting that I booked because it was the right time and the right place and the right prospect. I think you can you can get a lot of information on prospects prior to sending them anything. And for us, there's specific gates that I want people to meet for them to be a good account to me. So ultimately, there's some people that I wouldn't waste time on, and I and really as as a good SDR, I should know that prior to the engagement. So that's one thing. And I think another one on this is as an SDR or as someone doing prospecting, don't give your price away straight away. That's one thing that people will say, yeah, can have a price. And like someone told me early on in my sales career, that is one of the one things that you have that they want uh, at the start, at least prior to having a brilliant product or whatever. It's having, you've got a price and they want to know what the price is, but it's obviously changeable. We know that. So just don't just go chucking prices and figures at people early on in the sales process, maybe as a last resort, but I, I, I would treat that as a red flag and some try and get around rather than address head on personally. Yeah, absolutely. 
I uh, definitely agree with that. And um, I, I think we're good to to close this off now. Like, I appreciate everyone for attending. This has been uh, a great time chatting with everyone. If we didn't get to a question that you wanted answered or you think of something else, like 100% reach out to us on LinkedIn. I would love to connect with anyone. Sales is hard, but it's a lot easier when you have a nice community beside you to, to ask questions and support and things like that. So please do reach out. Would love to hear your just your general thoughts on what you thought of the webinar, um, if it was useful, because um, we'd love to do this again, I'm sure, at some point. So thank you all for attending. It's been awesome. Would love to connect with you all here soon um, and go out there and crush it in whatever you've got for the rest of your day. Yeah, thanks, people. Go and have a good end to the year. Go and smash it, guys. Yeah. <laughs>